Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Runs, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, I am so honored to introduce this event with James Peebles, presenting his latest book, Cosmology Century, an inside history of our modern understanding of the universe. Tonight's event is the next installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, we are so excited to continue the work of bringing the authors of recently published science-related literature to our community during these unprecedented times. Just like always, you can find announcements about upcoming events in this series at harvard.com slash events slash science. You can also sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com for more updates. Additionally, we do have a Science Research Public Lecture Series YouTube page where you can see any previous talks in the series that you might have missed. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask Professor Peebles something, please go to the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit your question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Also at the bottom of the screen during the presentation, you'll see a button to purchase tonight's featured book, Cosmologies Century. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore. So a huge thank you for your support. Your purchases and financial contributions, there is also a donate button at the bottom of the screen. Make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you to all of you out there for tuning in and for showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science, because it really, really matters. Uh, and finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few weeks, technical issues can arise, and if they do, they, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. So now, I am so delighted to introduce tonight's speaker. If you are here watching tonight, you are likely familiar with Professor Peebles' world-renowned discoveries and insights into theoretical cosmology, including, but not limited to, his work predicting the existence of the cosmic background radiation and in dark matter, cosmic structure formation, the origin of galaxies, and more. John Eleven calls him, quote, universally admired among cosmologists as one of the true greats of our time. Just last year, he was awarded, awarded the highest honor in his field, the Nobel Prize for Physics, for his groundbreaking work. He's currently the Albert Einstein Professor of Science Emeritus at Princeton University, and has been at Princeton now for roughly 60 years, I believe. Additionally, he is the author, co-author, or editor of many prior books, including The Large Scale Structure of the Universe, Principles of Physical Cosmology, Finding the Big Bang, and a textbook on quantum mechanics. Tonight, he will be presenting his landmark new book, Cosmology's Century. Of the book, Robert Kishner writes, quote, Peebles is the best possible guide to the long and winding road that is the 20th century's development of understanding the universe. His contributions are right at the center of this tale that now leads reasonable people to think the universe is governed by a tug of war between the unseen forces of dark matter and dark energy. Cosmology Century is a mirror for practitioners and a window for the curious. We are so happy to have him digitally here tonight. So without further ado, Professor Peebles, the digital podium is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> I am so delighted to be here and to be able to talk to you about what is known about the universe on its largest observable scales. I think it's good to start by uh, inviting you to consider what you see when you look around you, and then consider stepping back and looking at the bigger scale, then step back again and keep going. Here is my guide to what you might see. Sure. Ah, I'm always surprised when these things work. So, I, I particularly like this photograph of planet Earth. Uh, it was taken in the 1960s, one of the very first, taken from far enough away that you can see that the Earth is a sphere surrounded by dreadfully open space. 
Before this, we of course knew that the world is round and uh, we knew that the next planet is a long way away. But uh, knowing and seeing can be different. This image had a great, great impact on people. It was so impressive that the bureaucrats didn't know what to do with it, so they classified it. Uh, Stuart Brand was one of those leading the charge to get the images released. He used it as insignia for his book, The Whole Earth Catalog, what we would these days term school tools for living sustainably. If you're into that sort of thing, turning these pages is just fantastic. You see the guides to all kinds of tools, all manual. Let us look at the next slide. Here is the largest planet in our solar system. Very different from planet Earth, quite similar to the sun, similar composition, mostly hydrogen and helium, trace elements of what you and I are made of. It is not a star because it's too light, doesn't have enough mass to make enough pressure to cause thermonuclear reactions, but it is still cooling off from the heat of formation. It's cooling by rising currents of warm gas, falling currents of cold gas. The currents rising and falling are twisted by the rotation of the planet into these wonderful patterns. Here is our nearest star, the sun. The image on the right is a close-up of a bit of the surface. Heat is convected up through the surface through rising bubbles of hot plasma, falling bubbles of cooler plasma, making this wonderful pattern that you, that you see. Here, strong magnetic fields have gathered and prevent the, the convection, causing a cool spot, a sunspot. Here is our neighborhood of galaxy of stars. Here is the sun. The relative sizes of these stars are in proportion to where these sizes are. Of course, the sizes are greatly exaggerated relative to the distance between stars. The most massive star in our neighborhood is Sirius A here. It is twice the mass of the sun, that greater mass drives far, rate, far rate greater range of rates of thermonuclear reactions that makes it about 25 times the luminosity of the sun. That high luminosity is accompanied by a very hot surface. Hot is blue. Uh, it is going to run out of nuclear fuel well before the sun. When it does, it will shed some mass and the rest will collapse to a, a white dwarf. Sirius B over here has a mass of about that of the sun. It's far more compact. It began life as even more massive than Sirius A, exhausted its, its supply of nuclear fuel even earlier and collapsed already to a white dwarf. There are lots of stars less massive than the sun. They burn nuclear fuel far less rapidly. They're much less luminous and uh, their surfaces are much cooler redder. Kind of fun to consider down here, Proxima Centauri, uh, that little dwarf star, is known to have a planet circling it at just such a distance that water on the surface of that planet, assuming there is some, would neither freeze nor boil off. Wouldn't you just love to go over there and see what's happening on the surface of that planet? You can imagine people are giving great thought to that, sending masses of drones to fly by it. It's only four light years away, so, it, well, wouldn't take that long to, for the image to get back to us, four light years. Um, it's gonna take a lot longer to send drones all that distance, but people can dream, who knows, we'll see what happens. Astronomers have established that there are about as many planets uh, around stars as there are stars, so lots is happening in this little neighborhood. On a still larger scale, here's a picture of the sky showing the, the Milky Way. We're in a galaxy of stars. It's flattened like a disk. We are in the disk. We are looking through the disk and seeing this band of light. You're seeing dark bands running through the bands of light. That's not absence of stars, but presence of streams of interstellar dust that absorbs the light. We get a picture of what a galaxy of our sort looks like if we look at another one nearby that's seen face on. This beautiful galaxy uh, shows you dark streams of dust 
wound up by the differential rotation of this galaxy, you see blue spots. That's where stars have formed fairly recently. The most massive stars are still shining. They're producing most of the starlight. They're hot, they're blue, hence the blue patches. You see red patches. That's where these hot stars have ionized interstellar gas, made a plasma. The recombination line of hydrogen produces a very strong red line. That's recombining hydrogen. You notice a sheen of yellow near the center that actually continues through the whole galaxy. That's the light of some thousands of millions of planets like the sun, of stars like the sun. You pause to consider that the odds are good that there are about as many planets around these stars as there are stars. That's some thousands of millions of planets on which all sorts of marvelous things are happening that we, the human race, will never see. After all, this thing is some 10 million light years away. It gives you pause. Here is the distribution of the galaxies around us. Another step back. The red dots you see uh, are the massive galaxies, similar to the one we just looked at or to our Milky Way. You see two views, projection in perpendicular directions. So here is a particular galaxy, NGC 6946, in one direction, whoop, and the other. The black dots are smaller galaxies. There are lots of them. A remarkable empty space here, about a third of the space. One measly little galaxy in there. Wouldn't you love to know why it got there? Why there aren't more? Well, this is one of the studies of the evolution of the universe. It, impressive too, that in either projection you see a sheet of galaxies along here. Let's look still further back. Here is a picture of the distribution of galaxies across the sky. Oh, two, uh, as I'll describe later, galaxies are moving away from us. These galaxies typically are moving away from us at about 7% of the speed of light. They're pretty far away. You see this tight knot of galaxies. It is, in effect, a galaxy of galaxies. But you see something new. This spot, this spot looks much the same. That new effect is seen better if we look at the radio. The centers of galaxies contain massive compact objects. Well, they're very likely massive black holes. Sometimes they explode. And when they do, they can send out jets of exceedingly hot relativistic plasma that piles up in these radio lobes that can be very bright in the radio. Here is a distribution across the sky of the 10,000 or so brightest of those radio sources. I got to explain a lot of peculiar features. First is a hole in the center. That's not a hole in the world. That the, the telescope can't look there. Look there. You see some incomplete observations here. You see one dot right there. That's the uh, radio source I just showed you. It's so bright that it confuses the telescope when looking in that general direction. You get a hole. There's got to be another one here, but I've not quite figured out why there's this hole. Anyway, there are lots of fainter radio galaxies in stars in our galaxy, and they make this little band. That's the band of our Milky Way. So after all of that, you get to look around and ask yourself, what do you see? You see here, if you do a careful statistical analysis, that this is the same clumpy distribution as we saw in those earlier maps. But we're looking through so many clumps, clump upon clump, that it's averaged out to a large extent. And what you see, therefore, is nothing. This is a very deep result. Scientists focus on layers of perhaps on the natures of atoms or the way atoms combine together to make molecules, some so large as to make up cells of, of living beings, or how those cells make up beings such as us, or how we organize our, our cells in societies, or how we're organized into, into solar systems, and the solar systems organized in galaxies, 
on up. And of course, you can go down layer upon layer of things to study. But this is something new, nothing new. This is why we can have a cosmology. It is because on these large scales, the universe is close to uniform. It is not exactly uniform, of course. It is lumpy on small scales. But that large scale mean can be studied. We can in particular observe that the universe appears to be expanding. This is an image from 1930, I think still by far the best way to explain what is meant by the expansion of the universe. Imagine, imagine that we live not in three dimensions, but in two. Imagine we live on the surface of this balloon. You mustn't ask me, so what's off the surface of the balloon? You don't live there, you live on the surface of the balloon. That's what you experience. The balloon is being blown up by this curious figure. A long story, which we can't get into. Another caution, as the balloon is bl being blown up, the galaxies aren't expanding. You and I are not expanding. The galaxy is not expanding, but the galaxies are moving apart. And you notice if you sit on any one galaxy and look at around you as the balloon is blown up, you'll see that the galaxies are moving away from you. And you may say, wow, the universe is expanding and it's expanding away from me. It's a comforting thought, but of course you go over here and you see the same thing. This guy's moving away from me. This guy's moving away from me and so on. The universe is expanding away from me. That's the way it has to be in a universe that's uniform. Everybody has the same experience on average. You might also notice that if something is further away from me here, uh, it's moving away faster because this is moving away from me. This is moving away from this guy. So this one is moving faster than it is away from here. That's a key law, a key property of cosmology, and it is illustrated here. Um, astronomers have discovered that that recession that I tried to illustrate with the, with the balloon says that the further away the galaxy, the more rapidly it's moving. Here was a discovery plot, Edwin Hubble in the 30s, late 20s. Hubble, with great assist from Hummison in the 1936, uh, the furthest of the galaxies that they could observe is moving away at 10% of the speed of light. Wow, in 1936, people could look that far. Uh, I'm impressed to notice that I was one year old when astronomers could look that far. And to look much further than that took decades for the establishment of more, more efficient detectors and photographic plates. Well, I want to now um, give space to, to just one event in uh, the great progress that's been made in the study of the expanding universe since then. The end of the Second World saw a great explosion of energy in science and technology from particle accelerators to automobiles with tail fins. And maybe not surprising, these four people independently decided it's time to look more closely into this notion of an expanding universe. Bob Dickey on the left worked in war research in the radiation lab at MIT, radar and the like. Yakov Zeldovich on the right did war research in the Soviet Union, uh, ending up in the Soviet equivalent of Los Alamos, making great contributions to nuclear weapons. Fred Hoyle was a great author of, great exponent on how stars form, how they make elements, how the elements are distributed. In 1948, he introduced an alternative to the notion of the evolving universe, the steady state theory. I'll mention it briefly later. But I want to talk about a paper published in the same year, 1948, by George Gamow. Gamow was a refusenik, we might say, an emigre from the Ukraine. Uh, before the war, he made some interesting contributions to cosmology, but the great contribution in 1948 showed to me spectacular scientific intuition and ingenuity. He argued, we can't get into the tales, it's just the basic point, he argued that a sensible looking universe could evolve from a hot fence state along the way producing by thermonuclear reactions a lot of helium, nothing much beyond that, 
so that the universe would begin making stars with hydrogen and helium, and that there would be the radiation in a hot universe that would remain as the universe expands. The radiation wouldn't go away. It would just cool off as the universe expanded, but it would still be there. Alas, I think it must go with this deep intuition, uh, a certain dis disinterest in details. Gamov uh, was of that sort. Um, uh, and so his ideas were not forgotten, but they were never very heavily promoted. So now I come to the year 1964. 1964, 1964, Fred Hoyle in the UK, Cambridge, England, uh, is becoming aware of the astronomical evidence that stars contain a lot of helium, far more helium than he was expertise on element formation in stars could imagine forming in stars. Where in the world did that helium come from? He intensely disliked Gamow's hot Big Bang theory but he's a good scientist, and so he and Roger Taylor, a colleague, published a paper. It had a nice title, The Mystery of the Cosmic Helium Abundance, in which they uh, admitted, not very enthusiastically, but it was there in black and white, maybe this is the, rate, the helium left over from Gamow's hot Big Bang. Boyle knew very well that, that interstellar space seemed to be warm a few degrees above <clears throat> absolute zero because you could see absorption lines from the molecule cyanogen, a carbon and a nitrogen stuck together, not only from the ground level, but from the first excited level. What excited that level? Well, one possibility is a sea of radiation. We all knew about that earlier. I can cite two publications, but by 1964, he'd forgotten it. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, you see Jakub Zeldovich with two of his colleagues. Zeldovich, uh, being uh, an influential figure in nuclear weapons, had great influence. He had four socialist worker hero medals. When he wanted something from the bureaucracy, he put in those medals and he would get prompt attention. But of course, the, the authorities would never let him out of the Soviet Union. He knew too much. He found it hard to communicate outside the Soviet Union. Publications back and forth were censored. It took a long time to get through censoring. He had great difficulty publishing in the journals that people outside the Soviet Union read. And yet he made spectacular contributions to cosmology. But in 1964, he was under the impression that stars contained little helium. And therefore, Gamov's hot big bang theory must be wrong. He was working on the how you get a self-consistent theory or a universe that expands from a dense cold state. It's difficult because the, the matter tends to coalesce into, into helium under those conditions. We don't want all helium, we want a lot of hydrogen. As it happens, I was uh, in, the, in, in, in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, working with these guys on a suggestion by Bob Dickey. He had decided in 1964, quite independent of Gamow, he didn't know about Gamow, or if he did, he forgot about it, that a sensible universe would begin hot. And he uh, persuaded two of the young people in his group, David Wilkinson here, you can see he's holding a screwdriver, and Peter Roll, whose plaid shirt you can just make out, to build a Dickey radiometer. Bob had invented this technology during the war and use it to see if we might be in a sea of thermal radiation left over from a hot big bang. I, he had, I remember the meeting when he suggested this, and I remember his casually turning to me and saying, why don't you look into the theoretical implications? So Peter went off to education. David and I, for the rest of our careers, just followed Bob's suggestion. Funny how these things can happen. Meanwhile, in uh, New Jersey, 30 miles from us, the Bell Telephone Laboratories were experimenting with communication by microwave radiation, radiation in wavelengths of millimeters to centimeters. The first experiments already in 1959 showed something was wrong. The instrument was detecting more radiation than they could account for. The engineers were upfront about this, but uh, 
didn't know what to do about it. It's not their job to worry about it. So that anomaly remained a dirty little secret, so to speak, in the Bell Laboratories until 1964, when these two young guys, Arno, Wilson, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson, resolved to track down the source of this radiation. They exhaustively discovered all possibilities of origin within the instrument or the surroundings. They were at their wit's end. To their great credit, they didn't give up. And even more important, they complained about it until someone heard them and told them, you ought to get in touch with Bob Dickey and these guys who are doing an experiment off in Princeton that might be relevant to your problem. Those two got the Nobel Prize for this identification. It was right and proper. As I said, they did the right things. Um, I must admit, I've always been a little unhappy with the Nobel Committee for not admitting that the third person on that nomination, on that recognition, ought to have been Bob Dickey. But well, Bob has done many things well recognized for them. It's all right. So I guess I have to admit that uh, last fall, when I was awakened at five in the morning uh, and uh, was asked when I picked up the phone, are you Professor Philip James Edwin Peebles? And I admitted, yes, I am. Uh, uh, the voice said then, uh, we have voted to present you with the Nobel Prize. Do you accept? At this point, I could have stopped and said, well, I'd like to raise the issue of Bob Dickey. But I didn't. I meekly accepted, and the conversation got more friendly. Well, to carry on, this radiation is present. Our thinking in 1965, when it was recognized and all of these elements came together, was one of great excitement and relief. In 1964, we didn't know there was anything there to detect. It was a, it was a gamble in the dark. Uh, I had spent at least as much time preparing for a null result of the experiment as for a positive one. It was so exciting to know that something is there, something one can measure and something that we can analyze. Of course, you don't know whether, whether what's there is really radiation left over from the early universe. There is a characteristic signature, however. This radiation began as thermal radiation which has a very distinct spectrum, uh, sometimes talked about a Planck spectrum. You tell me the temperature, and remember the astronomers had a temperature of a few degrees above Kelvin, above absolute zero, a few Kelvin. I'll tell you the intensity at each wavelength. So now go and measure the intensity at each wavelength and see if it follows that curve. If it does, then that's pretty convincing evidence that this is left over from the hot early universe. So two groups, many groups started out trying to make this measurement, two succeeded. It's very difficult because you have to observe above the atmosphere. The atmosphere radiates, you have to get away from that. Here's one group, here's David Wilkinson. Here's John Mather, got the Nobel Prize for, oh, I didn't want to show that yet. The Nobel Prize, well, well deserved for this experiment. Um, second group, Herb Gush, University of British Columbia, Western end of Canada. I'm a little annoyed. I have to keep telling people where British Columbia is, but there it is. This guy was a brilliant, is a brilliant experimentalist, uh, and he had just the right skills to do this experiment. Here are his two able assistants, uh, Mark Halpern on our left and Herb Ed Wishno above. Uh, and this is my favorite. Uh, photograph of scientists' work of all time. If you knew nothing about these two except what you could infer from this image, would it inspire confidence? Okay, well, you shouldn't, I shouldn't ask you such questions. Anyway, here are the results. Moving to me to consider that both projects took 15 years from start to finish. They were completed within a few months of each other. Either made the point the radiation has the thermal spectrum expected from radiation from the early universe. Tangible evidence that the universe really did expand from a very different state. As is mentioned here, John Mather got the Nobel Prize for this. Well, well deserved. Uh, Herb Gush, 
got our deep, deep respect. Our Canadians are not always as assertive as they should be, but never mind. So I think I've gone far enough in telling you the sort of flavor of what goes on in this subject. In fact, it goes off in any other branch of physical science. Uh, so I, I would like to conclude these prepared remarks by quoting from a much deeply admired and influential expert on uh, philosophy and baseball, Yogi Berra, who made the wonderfully perceptive comment, you can see a lot by just looking. We made great progress in the study of the evolving universe, establishing that it really is expanding, that it really is evolving. Through the work of so many people, you're illustrating. I just like to kind of look at these people and, uh, and uh, admire what all went on and the many people who made so many great contributions to make this all happen. Stop sharing. Ah, here we are. Are we here? Yes, hello. Oh, good. All right, that was wonderful. Um, we're now gonna turn to question and answer. If anyone has a question they have not submitted yet, please feel free <laughs> to put it in the question box, but it looks like okay. we are quite a few. All right, I'm going to start with this one at the top. Um, Daniel asks, are you optimistic about understanding the nature of dark energy in the next 20 years? Uh, <laughs> dark matter is a little bit easier. Experience and progress may any day now detect it. Though I will caution you, uh, I, I think any day now we're gonna get a breathless announcement, dark matter has been detected. The first question you gotta ask yourself is, did you detect the dominant form of dark matter or only a trace element? There's gonna be a lot of debate about that, but that'll be fun. It'll be so exciting to have a new detection. It'll teach us a lot. It'll stimulate our thinking and the experiments will go on. Dark energy, which is just another name for Einstein's cosmological constant, uh, is a deep mystery. It's been a mystery, uh, in fact, when I was a postdoc in Bob Dickey's group, I remember discussions of the deep problem of the quantum vacuum energy density. Easy to, to, to see that the natural value of the quantum, the energy density of the quantum vacuum, which you know is a very complicated business, is some hundred orders of magnitude bigger than what would be allowed for Einstein's cosmological constant. It behaves like Einstein's cosmological constant, but it's a ridiculous value. So why is it that we have a cosmological constant? We have, in effect, quantum physics, dark zero-point energy, yet it's the wrong value by a ridiculous amount. There's a deep, deep discovery there to be made, uh, maybe by the next generation, but we leave it for them. Juliana is asking, what are the most pressing or interesting needs from engineers over the next few decades for advancing the field of cosmology? Oh, wow. Um, you know, great experiments are going on with space telescopes. The Hubble Space Telescope has been such a wonderful device. But on the ground, people are learning how to do all this as well um, at, at a fraction of the cost. Meanwhile, JWST, the next generation space telescope, will go up. It'll see marvelous new things. It's pretty much a standard rule. You look at the universe in a new way and you will see something new and surprising. I tried to give you a flavor of that by the images I showed you, the things around us on various scales. When these observations are made, we're going to be surprised, is my bet, and we're certainly going to be edified. There'll be a generation of observations after that. Uh, and certainly, uh, as, as detectors get more and more efficient and more and more ability to accumulate evidence, data, the ability to handle that data is going to get more and more complicated. Um, uh, who knows, perhaps AI will solve the problem, but there's going to be a fascinating business already going on of learning how to accumulate vast amounts of data and then how to learn how to handle the data. There's actually a follow-up question here from Jernej, who asks, uh, should finding new means of propulsion that will take us deeper into space be on that list? 
that you were just talking about. Well, yeah, blah, blah. I don't know how far we're going to get into space. It would be so so wonderful to see to see the surface of a planet that's not too far away, maybe four light years. Getting there, though, uh, would require that you get up, let's say, to a tenth the speed of light. It would take you 30 or 40 years. That's not too bad. Would you volunteer to go? What's going to happen, I think, almost for sure, is that there are going to be uh, drones sent up, accelerated by light pressure. They'll get up to a tenth the speed of light. They'll zip by this, this planet and take a snapshot, send it back. It's going to be blurry. We're going, to, we're going to be so tantalized. But, you know, to discover what's happening on a planet or on another planetary system is going to be so moving. It's a, it's a goal that we just can't resist. Humanity is going to keep pushing for it, provided, of course, that we don't blow ourselves up first. Uh, Amir is asking, what are your thoughts on alternative theories to inflation? Um, um, so inflation uh, is an answer to the question, what was the universe doing before it was expanding? It's a very attractive answer. On the other hand, uh, we should be careful because it's been on the books for, for 40 years. Greeted with great excitement, an elegant idea. So elegant that to some it must be right. The problem is we don't yet have a real theory of inflation. We have a picture. A great challenge remains, make a definite prediction and then test it. Until we have that, I'll not be advertising evidence that inflation really happened. It's, it's a wonderful idea. People are floating alternatives, and uh, we should keep an open mind. Uh, and again, I would caution you, the next time you see in the newspaper, inflation proved, or else inflation disproved, be very cautious because almost certainly there'll be big arguments on whether it's been really disproved. Maybe you simply used the wrong version of inflation. Again, a wonderful problem for the next generation. We'll add it to the list. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from Matt. I think you touched on this a little bit, but uh, what are the most important areas of further research in cosmology? Luckily, there are lots of areas for research, and lots of people are these days fascinated in carrying out that research. My favorite is the formation of galaxies, <clears throat> because they're complicated, but not so complicated that you can't see lots of fascinating regularity in their properties. Uh, and um, maybe I'm only fooling myself, but I think the standard theories of how the galaxies form based on this the theory I wrote down in the 1980s has a name, Lambda CDM. It's worked remarkably well so far, uh, far better than ever I expected. Uh, but, you know, all the tests are of limited accuracy, and there's certainly lots of room for a better theory than Lambda CDM. I'll be amazed if that's the last word. In fact, it's, it's inconceivable. There will be a better theory, and whether it changes our outlook on how galaxies form is to be discovered. But meanwhile, if we find that Lambda CDM doesn't present us with a reasonably convincing picture of how the galaxies form, then we have potentially a hint to how to make a better theory. Uh, so I'm enjoying very much studying progress in theories of galaxy formation and seeing what I hope are not germa, not uh, will of the West, but actual hints to how the theory can be improved by improving the cosmology. All right, it's a big list to pull from here. Um, Alan Rubin is asking, does the expansion of the universe increase the distances between the electron shells and the nuclei of atoms? No. The atoms are not expanding. You and I are not expanding. The Earth is not expanding. Well, maybe a little bit. The Earth evolves. The galaxies are not expanding very much. Um, but the distance between galaxies is increasing. It's a complicated business, uh, but you must understand the expansion of the universe has no effect on you and me, except for that crazy cosmological constant, dark energy. 
it's a constant under standard model, a constant that, that pushes a little bit on everything. And so you and I are being slightly pushed apart. Don't worry, it's not a very big effect. The galaxy is being pushed apart very slightly. It's still not a very big effect. But of course, on still larger scales, it becomes significant. Anyway, apart from that, we are quite isolated from the expansion of the universe. It doesn't pull on us. It doesn't do anything, except for tidal fields. That includes atoms, it includes you and me, and it includes our, our, our planet. Um, Bill Bloomberg is asking you to comment on the tension between different measurements of the Hubble constant. Right. To me, uh, it's so Im impressive that the measurements are as close as they are. One measurement is, is based on what astronomers observe about galaxies relatively nearby. How far away are they? How fast are they moving? The ratio is Hubble's constant. It's a measure of the rate of expansion of the universe. A very difficult measurement. It's hard to get accurate distances to galaxies, but, but people are clever. Detectors are better and better. They're making spectacular progress in getting that expansion rate. Meanwhile, back at a redshift, back when the universe was 1,000th its present size, when the temperature was 3,000 Kelvin rather than 3 Kelvin, the earlier universe uh, was so hot that matter was thermally ionized as a plasma. At a temperature of around 3,000 Kelvin, the plasma combined to neutral atoms. Before the recombination, uh, the plasma interacted strongly with radiation, we'll see radiation, thermal radiation, uh, specifically free electrons scatter radiation very well. Ions scatter electrons very well. The result is that the electrons, ions, and radiation act like a fluid with viscosity, but also sound pressure. The effects of those sound pressure can be moved, can be observed as oscillations. From that, you can infer what the expansion rate of the universe ought to be, and there's a 10% discrepancy. In my entire career, I've been seldom being being disturbed at 10% discrepancies. This field used to be, well, a factor of two in the Hubble expansion rate. Um, that 10% though is very exciting because if it's real, it's a hint to how to make a better theory. I think the best way to go forward, of course, is to keep pursuing this apparent discrepancy. Is it really true? Or is there some deeply subtle systematic error? But also to make many other comparisons of a similar sort that can be done so far, don't show any anomaly. It can be done better. And in the best of all possible worlds, we'll start to see a pattern of anomalies of this sort. That will be a really good clue on where to go for a still better theory. I should emphasize, I don't think the standard lambda CDM theory is going to be shown to be radically far off. Uh, I think it's very clear from many measurements that it's a good approximation but it's by no means the final answer. And surely there's a better theory and uh, it'll be really exciting to have find clues that would guide us to that better theory. I have a question here from Mel who asks, how does current science skepticism affect reporting in a constantly evolving field like cosmology? Well, of course, uh, um, um, we have it so good uh, compared to, let us say, uh, well, epidemiology. People have known for a long time that smoking is not good for you. Uh, but you but, but think it far beyond that, and you shouldn't drink too much. When you get into details, it gets very complicated. Epidemiology is a really complicated subject. It's a science, an important one, really vitally important. But getting it right is so hard. We in cosmology had a much easier task. That, of course, is why we've arrived at a compelling case that we have a good approximation to what really happened. Because we can make pretty clean predictions to test and check out the theory. Hard to make experiments in, in epidemiology um, and, in fact, well, the COVID virus uh, so complicated. 
Um, those people are really working hard. They're going to make progress. They are making progress, but uh, that's a much harder field. Um, I have a personal question for you. Joe Blatt wants to know um, a little bit more about your formation as a scientist, your education, early work, whatever you'd like to talk about. Well, I can tell you the story of my life um, <laughs> briefly. Uh, I'm, I, I realized I was a very unsatisfactory student in high school, not because I was any way rebellious, but rather I was a dreamer. Uh, I did the homework, but I didn't pay much attention. Um, I skipped classes. I, I just a dreamer. The result was I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated from high school. Uh, so I, I, I entered the University of Manitoba in, in engineering. That was all right. And I guess I could have made my way through life as a, as a mediocre engineer. But to my intense good fortune, um, I started complaining about the lack of physics courses. And I got the suggestion, well, why don't you transfer to physics? I did. Uh, I immediately discovered that what I love to do is physics. I'm so deeply grateful to the faculty and students at the University of Manitoba in physics. They showed me a lot about how to do physics. And then they shipped me off to Princeton for more work. So I just followed directions. I got to Princeton. I fell into orbit around Bob Dickey. And here I am, still at Princeton. It's sort of lack of imagination, isn't it? Uh, let's see. Marty Glassman has a question. Do you have any comments on Sir Roger Penrose's hypothesis of cyclic cosmology? Roger is a deeply impressive person. I love to talk to him. Um, but he's a theorist, and theorists will have ideas, and not all ideas can be right. I just do not know how to judge the quality of his theories. But let him keep going. It's such a track record. We must pay attention to him. Hmm. All right. There are so many questions here. I'm trying to pick one. Let's see. Uh, do, do, do. Matt wants to know, does Hubble's law eventually have to level off so as not to exceed the speed of light? It gets a little complicated, doesn't it? We talk about recession velocity. That's a good approximation when the velocities are small. Uh, the nearby galaxies are moving away from us. And indeed, the theory says, and I think it's pretty convincing, if you ran a tape measure between us and a nearby galaxy, you would see that you have to pay out the tape measure. The distance is increasing. That's OK. And it's, it's a good thought experiment if the galaxies are not too far away. But the further away they get, the less possible that thought experiment is, and the less good it is to think of the redshift, which is what is observed, the shift of radiation toward the red, uh, as a motion away. Because that motion away, when computed at a hypersurface of fixed time, can exceed the velocity of light. Nothing wrong with that. Special relativity is still a good theory, but it's a local theory. And general relativity theory only satisfies special relativity on local scales. Uh, so in fact, um, as a construct, yes, the universe is expanding faster than the velocity of light. But of course, it's not an observable effect. Um, I have another speed of light question for you. Um, this uh, audience member says, I have read that in the very early seconds of the universe, its expansion rate was faster than the speed of light. How can that be possible? Well, there you go. It still is faster than the speed of light if you look far enough away. Again, this is what the theory, Einstein's general theory of relativity predicts. Mm -hmm. Until recently, you could take that theory or leave it alone. Well, not so recently. When I began as a graduate student, there was one serious test of general relativity, the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. The rest of the classical tests were really very poor. Since then, uh, the tests have improved immensely, so that by now we have a really convincing story. Of course, general, that's not to say that general relativity theory is the absolute truth. I'm not sure there is such a thing, but it is a wonderfully good approximation. 
And that theory says, yes, in the early universe, the expansion rate was so great that should you be able to live in that immense heat, you would see that objects not very far away are moving away at immense speeds. So that you can't see very far away. Everything is redshifted away because it's recessing, it's moving away faster than the speed of light. That's the way it is, and we must live with it. Okay. Uh, this question, could you comment on variable light theories and how they might provide an alternative explanation to cosmic inflation theory? We should consider alternatives to the standard theory that's been so well tested, has so many tests. I don't see hope for variable speed of light theories there, except in some subtle correction to be discovered. Uh, inflation, I deeply respect, but I also insist that it's not yet to be added to our canon of established, persuasively established physics. It's a beautiful idea, but until we get experimental tests, there was great hope for that with polarization that didn't quite work out. So there's still this big challenge. Find us tests of what happened before the universe was expanding. Will it be inflation? Many are betting so, but I wouldn't put any, I wouldn't settle any bets until we have some evidence. I don't even, I have not even heard of some of these theories. People are very knowledgeable about <laughs> this subject. Yes, let a, let a thousand theories bloom, but only a few are gonna be on the right track. Yeah, um, I have another, another question about a theory is, um, what do you think of multiverse theories um, from <laughs> one of your former students, Bob Zacker, ah. class of 80. Oh boy. So multiverses. Um, I guess I am becoming a crusty old man. I'm certainly getting old, so crusty. Well, um, theory is a wonderful thing. I love theories. I, I, it is so romantic to think of multiverses. Beautiful idea. But is it to be admitted to the canon of established physics? No. In fact, it can't be because by construction, there's no way to check on all those other universes. And so to my way of thinking, multiverses are a wonderful idea, but to be put in there with fairy tales. Now, I don't, I don't that's, that's a little, no. But on the other hand, yes. Did you grow up with just so stories? how the leopard got its spots. I think so. Well, I hope so. Wonderful stories, but they're made up. And is inflation made up? Maybe not. We'll see. It has lots of arguments for it, but we'll see. Are multiverses made up? Yes. <laughs> In my book. I don't think that you're crusty for thinking that all right, um, I think, okay, I love this question um, and I'm gonna tack something of my own onto it. So someone says, dear professor, thank you very much for your talk. Could you please give some advice to the new generation of cosmologists? And I know that you've given us a hefty list of things to tackle for the new generation. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also hoping that you could comment something on women in cosmology. Um, I'm really interested in physics myself and I know that the history of cosmology has featured so many male prominent figures. So I'm excited to see what the future holds for women in the field too. Did you notice the very last slide I showed, a bunch of photographs of people? Mm -hmm. You notice some women in there? Yes. But if you, um, I think women are less underrepresented in the fields of cosmology and ast astronomy than in say particle physics, am mm -hmm. I wrong? I think so. Yeah. Uh, and um, we are making progress. Um, I, I mean, I've, uh, when I came to Princeton, uh, it was it was all male. We all wore suits and ties. It was pretty dreadful. <laughs> it loosened up a lot. Uh, we became co-ed. What was it around 1970? Now I think there are more women undergraduates than men. Mm. Uh, we're working very hard on the graduate school level, uh, but we have women on the faculty, three, it's not enough, but we're working on it. Well, I forgot the original question. Well, 
the role of physics, the role of women in, 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 in society, well, uh, we are learning. What else was your question? I've forgotten. I got um, the, the audience question, which I slightly derailed, was advice you have for the next generation oh, of cosmologists. <laughs> uh, I can own First, uh, bear in mind that cosmology is just one branch of natural science. There are so many branches for you to choose from. I would, although I didn't ever pause to consider what I wanted to do, it seemed to just fall to me. I try to urge students uh, to look around and consider various possibilities before becoming committed to any one. You may find this subject or that particularly interesting for a while, but as you look into it, you may notice that, well, this other subject is even more interesting. You, you will do well if you can find a subject that fascinates you so much that you're willing to spend a lot of your career working on that subject. I think pretty clearly you don't make good progress in any subject, cosmology, anything else, unless you become committed to doing good things by working very hard at it. I feel moved at this point to also throw in a caution. Don't judge your career by prizes and awards. Judge your career by what you did, what you think of it. Uh, I, I stress that because, well, I made mention of Nobel Prizes, wonderful things, but their award has got to be capricious because there are so many people who are doing so many things that a lot of, a lot of eventualities have to occur before the Nobel Committee will deign to look at you. Ignore them. If, if you get these prizes, wonderful, wonderful. But if you don't, it's not a negative reflection on you. It's just the capricious nature of these awards. Cosmology still has a lot of open questions. Um, but on the other hand, look around you, you might find something even more interesting. That sounds great. So do you think we have time for one more question? There's so many here. I'm just trying to pick one. Oh my gosh. How will I choose? Let's go to the top. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, I'm being so indecisive. Okay. The question that says, cosmologists are always building new instruments and telescopes designed to measure cosmological parameters with increasing precision. At what point do we decide to stop? Never. Never. People talk of final theories. I don't know whether they exist. Maybe it's successive approximations all the way down. Bear in mind, none of our physics is complete. It's approximations. None of our measurements is, is, is infinitely precise. They're approximations too. Working on those approximations, tuning them up ever better, better theories, better experiments, we made spectacular progress in so many branches of physics. We haven't approached completion in any of them. And um, I can't see completion of cosmology anytime soon. I'm quite willing to believe that it's going to be successive approximations all the way. So do you think there's a limit to what we can learn in cosmology? Well, uh, uh, I suppose there's a limit to everything, but yeah. have we come close to it? No, yeah. we haven't. I like that. I think we should end there. Uh, thank you once again to Professor Peebles for your presentation and for all of your outstanding work. Uh, uh, and thank you to all of you digital audience for spending your evening with us. Please feel free to learn more about this important book and purchase Cosmology Century at the link below. Uh, so on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, please have a good night. Please keep reading and be well. Well, fair city. It was fun. <laughs>